In December 1942, after a year of a raging Pacific War, endless Allied warships arrived for repairs off Sydney Harbor. Some came under steam, others under sail, tow, or even underwater in the case of submarines. But only one ship arrived backwards. She was USS New Orleans, a 10,000-ton heavy cruiser and a key piece of the Pacific Arsenal. Following an intense naval battle, the crew was forced to make do with some unorthodox repairs to get the ship back to a safe harbor. This included a jury-rigged bow made of coconut logs, which helped her stay afloat. Due to the damage and the temporary tropical bow, the only way to navigate was to sail roughly 1,800 miles in reverse to port. Arriving in Sydney near Christmas time, the battered USS New Orleans prepared for the extensive repairs that would ready her to fight again. After all, her crew knew all too well what it was to fight in the worst of circumstances. As the sun rose on December 7, 1941, the 10,000-ton heavy cruiser USS New Orleans, led by Captain Howard Harrison Good, was moored at Pearl Harbor. That morning, the massive 588-foot-long New Orleans-class heavy cruiser, commissioned into the United States Navy in 1934, was connected to electrical power ashore as her engines were under repair. At 7.55 a.m., as Japanese aircraft flew over Pearl Harbor, unleashing their attack on the unprepared Americans, the temporary electrical supply to New Orleans was severed. As chaos reigned on the U.S. Navy base, everyone aboard USS New Orleans, approximately 899 officers and enlisted men, faced an unimaginable scenario. They were forced to deal with a surprise aerial attack without power and lived to tell the tale. This surprising power cutoff meant handling as many of her operations as possible manually without the benefit of machinery. Yet they rose to the challenge, determined to survive and defend their ship. First, some of the crew attempted to start the engines by raising steam using only flashlights. On the other side of the ship, a team of sailors had no choice but to break the locks on ammunition lockers as the keys were lost and access the guns and anti-aircraft shells. Above deck, sailors, undeterred by the imminent danger, armed themselves with rifles and pistols, ready to fire upon the incoming Japanese fighters and bombers. With ammunition finally at hand, the crew faced the daunting task of manually operating the normally automated 5-inch 25 caliber anti-aircraft guns. They hoisted the heavy shells through a manual lift system. Each round was loaded, aimed, and fired as wave after wave of Japanese aircraft bore down on them. The sky seemed to fill with enemy planes, but the men persisted and fought back against the relentless assault. All the while, Japanese machine gun fire peppered the 61-foot deck of the cruiser, threatening the lives of every man working tirelessly to fight back despite the challenges. A fragmentation bomb exploded nearby, causing light damage and injuring several crew members with shrapnel. As the attack subsided, despite some injuries, the men survived the attack with no losses. Damage sustained by the cruiser was minimal, allowing her to return to service almost immediately. This swift recovery was crucial, as the U.S. officially entered World War II, and USS New Orleans quickly became a vital asset in the Pacific theater. With renewed purpose, New Orleans undertook a variety of missions. She ferried troops to strategic locations, escorted convoys to Brisbane and Noumea, and joined Task Force 11 at Pearl Harbor. The cruiser played a key role in the Battle of the Coral Sea, rescuing 580 crew members from the damaged USS Lexington. Her presence was equally significant during the Battle of Midway, the first major decisive engagement between American and Japanese forces. By November 1942, the situation for Japanese forces on Guadalcanal had become desperate. Facing critically low supplies of food and ammunition, the troops were on the brink of collapse. To sustain their beleaguered garrison, the Japanese Navy cleverly devised a series of high-risk nocturnal supply runs known as the Tokyo Express. Under the cover of darkness, fast destroyers dashed through perilous waters to deliver vital provisions and reinforcements, evading Allied air and naval superiority. In case of an encounter, the Japanese had a significant armament advantage, as they were equipped with advanced Type 93 long lance torpedoes, which had a longer range and were more powerful than their American counterparts. On the night of November 30th, 1942, near Tassaparanga Point on Guadalcanal, a Japanese task force consisting of eight destroyers under the command of Rear Admiral Raizo Tanaka was en route to Guadalcanal with a supply mission. Meanwhile, the United States Navy, aware of the Japanese resupply efforts, planned an interception with Task Force 67, 
commanded by Rear Admiral Carlton H. Wright. It was a powerful formation, comprising the heavy cruisers USS Northampton, USS Minneapolis, USS New Orleans, and USS Pensacola, plus the light cruiser USS Honolulu and fleet destroyers screening the cruiser force. As the American ships steamed toward Guadalcanal through the darkness, they detected the approaching enemy destroyers on radar. With no time to lose, the U.S. Navy cruisers and destroyers prepared for an ambush, positioning themselves to intercept the Japanese force. Despite their preparations, the battle quickly turned chaotic, especially for USS New Orleans and her captain, Clifford Harris Roper. Near midnight, the American ships engaged Rear Admiral Tanaka's flotilla in what would soon become known as the Battle of Tassafaranga. As the American ships opened fire, Tanaka's force responded with a devastating long lance torpedo attack, exploiting the confusion and darkness of the night. The torpedoes, filled with their explosive power, sliced through the Pacific Ocean waters and headed directly toward the American task force. Within minutes, USS Northampton was engulfed in flames. The damage was so extensive that minutes later, she began to sink beneath the waves. She was not the only one, as Minneapolis and Pensacola were both severely damaged, their steel hulls torn open by the ferocious blasts. Amidst the chaos, even one of the Japanese destroyers, Takanami, was sunk. As the damage beyond repair USS Minneapolis slowed down, beleaguered following the direct hit from the Japanese, the nearby USS New Orleans, so far unscathed, maneuvered to avoid colliding with the ship. The crew scrambled to maintain control through the bedlam happening in the waters, but in doing so, the heavy cruiser made a fatal mistake. She exposed her port side. A second later, a powerful Japanese Type 93 torpedo struck her just forward of turret number two. The impact was cataclysmic, causing a massive explosion that detonated the ship's forward magazine and fuel tanks. The blast rocked New Orleans and everyone inside her, sending a shockwave through her frame and igniting a literal and figurative inferno. The explosion blew her bow completely off, hurling debris into the night sky and destroying well over a hundred feet of hull. The forward section of the ship vanished in an instant, taking with them 182 brave souls. As the detached bow swung around to the port side, it continued to wreak havoc by punching several holes in the remaining hull, further compromising the ship's integrity. Unless everyone left on board acted fast, USS New Orleans was doomed. With nearly a quarter of her length gone, USS New Orleans slowed to two knots. Blazing forward, the ship fought for survival. The devastation of the direct torpedo hit was considerable. According to Herbert Brown, a seaman in the ship's plotting room, quote, the bow was gone. 125 feet of ship and number one main battery turret with three eight-inch guns were gone. 1,800 tons of ship were gone. Oh my God, all those guys I went through boot camp with, all gone. With a collective will to survive, the crew began their efforts to save New Orleans. Throughout the night and against all odds, individual acts of heroism, self-sacrifice, and exceptional seamanship kept the ship afloat. One of these men was Lieutenant Commander Hubert Hader, the damage control officer on the ship, who, along with two of his men, Lieutenant Richard Haynes and Ensign Andrew Foreman, stayed at their posts. Despite the fact that their compartment was filling up with toxic fumes, they understood that their work was vital as they were the ones assessing and managing the damage, directing efforts to control flooding, and maintaining the ship's stability. Working tirelessly amidst the chaos, the trio continued their efforts until they ultimately succumbed to the toxic in their fight to save the ship and their shipmates. Howell M. Forgey, the ship's chaplain, later wrote about Lieutenant Commander Hader, quote, I wondered what he thought about in those final minutes, but I knew one thing. He was not afraid. Though badly damaged, after a night of endless work, USS New Orleans at least remained afloat. With this, the heavy cruiser then limped back to Tulagi Harbor across from Guadalcanal, carefully moving under cover of camouflage at a painfully slow speed of 2.3 miles per hour to see which temporary repairs can be made to save the ship. Once at Tulagi, the true extent of the damage to the heavy cruiser was finally visible. With most of the front section gone, many at the base believed she should either be abandoned or scuttled but Captain Roper would not allow this. With very limited resources or friendly ports near Tassafaranga Point on Guadalcanal, the crew had to improvise. With incredible creativity, they brought trunks of coconut trees on board to jury-rig a temporary bow. 
This makeshift solution helped shore up the large section of the ship, exposed to the elements after the original bow was blown away, getting the ship in the best condition possible for the journey ahead. After working non-stop for 11 days, the surviving crew of New Orleans got the ship in good enough condition to sail to Australia for more permanent repairs. However, there was one major problem. Sailing normally would cause New Orleans to take on water and inevitably sink. So the crew devised a daring plan. They would sail the ship stern first. This unprecedented maneuver saw New Orleans cover nearly 2,000 miles of open ocean in reverse, navigating treacherous waters to reach Sydney, Australia, arriving there on Christmas Eve. There, Australian workmen fitted a false bow to USS New Orleans, enabling the ship to steam across the Pacific to an American shipyard, where she underwent a major refit, including the construction and fitting of a new permanent bow. Returning to frontline service in mid-1943, the heavy cruiser in New Orleans was ready to fight once again. After surviving the harrowing Battle of Tessafaranga, USS New Orleans re-entered the Pacific Fleet in August 1943. The rest of the year was relatively quiet for New Orleans, her crew, and new captain Ralph Otis Davis. In October, she bombarded Wake Island, then sailed between many Pacific islands in a similar role. At the start of 1944, New Orleans returned to the Marshall Islands to strike airfields and other Japanese installations. She participated in the raid on Truk in the Carolines in February 1944, where she and her task forces combined gunfire sank a light cruiser, a destroyer, a trawler, and a submarine chaser. In June, during the Battle of the Philippine Sea, American forces sank three Japanese carriers and destroyed almost every aircraft launched against them. The few enemy planes that penetrated the American carriers were shot down by New Orleans and other escorts. This victory rendered Japanese naval aviation virtually non-existent for the remainder of the war. As 1945 rolled around, New Orleans continued supporting the Allied push in the Pacific, training in Hawaii before joining forces at Okinawa. She was at Subic Bay when Japan surrendered, ending the war in the Pacific. The heavy cruiser served as transport for liberated Allied prisoners of war, and was ultimately decommissioned in 1947, after 13 years of service. The New Orleans-class cruiser was one of the United States Navy's most decorated World War II ships. During her service, she earned 17 battle stars, the American Defense Service Medal, the American Campaign Medal, the Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal, the World War II Victory Medal, five Navy Crosses, 10 Silver Stars, one Bronze Star, and one Air Medal. In 